أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم I begin as I always begin in the name of Allah whose grace I seek in this and in all other matters well I have been asked about my journey to Sufism and I've never really been asked about this before I've never sort of like told the story about all of the steps and stages towards it so because this is not the kind of thing I think I need a live stream and you know some feedback with I decided that I would do this one first even though um, it only got 14 votes and the other two most uh, voted topics um, got 15 those two I think will work way better when I have you know organized for a live meeting um, so I want to tell this story, although it's the first time that I've ever told it, and um, <clears throat> to understand it, you really have to begin at the beginning of my Islam. I had been curious about Islam and had done a little bit of light reading and a little bit of interaction with um, local Muslim communities <clears throat> around my University of Pennsylvania undergraduate um, community. <clears throat> and uh, as a political statement with regard to the politics of um, gender and sexuality and race, I had started wearing long clothes and I had even started covering my hair, although most often I covered my hair in like a gaily or just a short scarf or, you know. <clears throat> and I had been doing that maybe for six months and I um, <clears throat> went to a mosque in Washington DC where my family lived while I was an undergraduate in um, the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia on Thanksgiving Day in 1972. Now I did not go to this mosque to become Muslim. I wanted information because I had been you know, beginning to learn and, you know, learning from disparate sources. So <clears throat> I thought, well, it's a mosque. I ought to be able to get some information. And instead, you know, they said, if you believe there's no God but Allah, Muhammad is prophet, you just take your shahada. So I thought, okay, well, I'm a free agent. I'll take my shahada. And uh, they gave me a little booklet on how to perform the prayer. And as far as information goes, they gave me very little. But it became sort of my spiritual home for the next um, several months because I didn't have a network in Philadelphia. So whenever I'd come to visit my mother, uh, the good news was that I didn't have classes on Friday. So I used to come down on Thursday evenings and I used to go to Juma there. And then I could go back, you know, over the weekend at some point to be ready for classes again. Um, they were tabligi jama, I should say, and all the women wore niqab, and eventually I did too, but um, once I took the shahada, then I started wearing my scarf in a fashion that to me sort of represented Islam, and not all the scarves that I owned worked well with it. Some were just too short because they were good for a wrap, but they weren't good for, you know, a drape, and I really like drapes, you know. Um, so anyway, um, what I did do was to access the University of Pennsylvania library archives to read anything and everything that I could find about Islam. And I had no system for this. So I just randomly picked up things and sometimes I read stuff that was horrific. The most horrific stuff I've ever read about the Prophet وسلم, I read during that period. I thought, well, that's not gonna float. So one of the visits to my family, I ran into uh, friends from my um, childhood and uh, a sister, uh, two sisters, um, and one of them said, oh, I know something about that, um, you know, because I was talking about what I was learning from Islam and I looked, you know, more Islamic. And um, she gave me a copy of the Quran. Apparently these guys had been proselytizing in the street to try especially get more women to join and, you know, she had been amongst those they had kind of tried to bring in. Um, and there I was thinking, you know, this is another thing to read, right? And actually, 
I think it was kind of backwards. I should have known about the Quran in terms of the prioritization, in terms of its significance historically, and the experience of revelation, all that. But no, you know, it was random. So I guess I needed five months to see whether or not I would stick it out with the random knowledge that I had received. Because once I got the Quran, I fell in love. And um, I wanted to remove every interference between myself and understanding this text. So I started teaching myself Arabic because the Arabic courses at my university start only at the beginning of the academic year. And um, by this time, you know, we're in the late spring and I would have to wait three, four months. So um, there's a little um, Arabic exercise book that starts with each of the letters with each of the vowel sounds a e u so ba bi bu ta ti tu and it goes all the way to two syllable words and then it goes to um, longer words and then it is the 30th juz of the quran the entire juz and i used to read that every day after i prayed my fajr salat um, and at the same time, I began memorizing the Quran. So anything that I had learned before then, I relearned because the transliteration gave me um, a South Asian pronunciation, first of all. Um, uh, and um, it, it didn't work once I started looking at the actual Arabic letters. Um, and so when I took my first course in Arabic in the fall, everything that I had learned about the Qur'an came up in the classes because it's the language, right? So that was like, I don't know, it just some of this stuff just sort of like it seemed faded to me, like, you know, that I was supposed to do this and I was supposed to do this in this way and at this time because I never considered myself to have any propensity for languages before this time. But once I started studying Arabic, it just, you know, it went on and on and on. And one of the places that it went was going to the Arabic-speaking world, particularly North Africa, Middle East. First, I went with my um, first husband, and eventually I taught English while I was there for two years. Um, I was there for two years, and I taught English for one year, and he was a student. And um, then uh, I went to Egypt um, while I was doing my graduate studies, and I was already moving myself towards the Quran. Now, not so much in, in Libya, the first place, but in Egypt, I became aware of Sufi communities and things that they did. In fact, I attended a zikr um, at a woman's house that was led by a Syrian sheikh. Um, and yet, I didn't understand that there is a path towards one specific dedication within the formula known as the tariqa. Now, tariqa literally means path, the path that you take, the lane, the, you know, the course that you follow. And um, in the history of Islamic mysticism, uh, when the you know, ecstatic period was over. Uh, and that's where people like Al-Halaj, you know, whose experience of Edwaman with the law was so passionate and so intense that he left off his separate self and claimed his Edwaman with the law by saying, Anna Al-Haq, I am the Haq, the, the, the truth uh, as an attribute of Allah. And they killed him. And they didn't just kill him, kill him. They plucked out his eyes, they cut out his tongue, uh, they crucified him, uh, and uh, then they burnt him. However, the story goes, when they threw his ashes on the river, the ashes formed the words, Haq, you know. So anyway, those are just the stories. And I love those stories. I used to read those stories, and particularly I was in love with Rabi al 
I think because I still linger in the nafs al-lawama, you know, the three stages of the nafs, take a moment to kind of explain these for people who are not familiar. In the Quran, some of the Sufi traditions say there are five. I'm going to stick with the Quranic three. And, and <clears throat> uh, the first one is nafs al-amara bisu, the nafs or the soul that orders towards doing good. That means you don't get control of your animal nature and you partake of things in any way that you feel good to partake in um, and have no regard for whether or not it is good for your soul or good for the souls of other people or good for the earth or good for your relationship with Allah. You just do it because it feels good. And um, that also includes harming others. Um, because you, you just don't have any regard. Uh, the next stage is nafs al And nafs al is the self-castigating self. So the, the self that is always running a tight, self-critical perspective and, you know, sometimes includes utopic uh, visions and expectations so it was very easy for me to read this Sufi hagiography because they seem to have arrived at a state where their experience with Allah was so transcendent it was like, you know, uh, floating in the air. You know, like one of the stories about Rabi al was when she was with Hassan um, al-Basri who, um, you know, did this thing about throwing his prayer rug on the water and having it uh, sustain itself so he could step out onto the water and she said you know that's nothing kind of thing and she threw hers in the air and you know and then she said and that's nothing too you know so um, I just I love these stories I loved her uh, ecstatic expression of love and connection to Allah um, oh Allah if I worship you for fear of hell you know, throw me into hell. If I worship you because I desire um, heaven, don't give me heaven. But if I worship you because of the, your own self, do not deny me that self. You know, this, this ardent love for Allah. And the way that I, again, I gravitate towards the name Wadu, the loving, the way that I wanted to have this kind of loving and intimate relationship with Allah that really just sort of carried me through all the vicissitudes of life is tempered by the idea that I will never do that. And in fact, I have not. And as a consequence, I have a lot of self-criticism. So amongst the Sufis uh, that I liked, uh, not only uh, Rabi Ladawiya, obviously, because she was a woman with such amazing, you know, beautific love, uh, was also an muhasibi uh, And an muhasibi is named that because of his self-inspection. Uh, so uh, hisab is like math. Muhasib is a self uh, um, in, uh, calculation, um, you know, beautiful, but a little bit on the somber side, you know, but uh, he was just one of my favorites and I read so much. So I read a lot of literature and yet when I would be in places like Cairo, I never seemed to be able to get into something that kind of led to an understanding and a functional relationship with Sufi communities, let alone a tariqa. You know, as I said, a little bit of zikr, the Syrian sheikha, and, um, you know, they have mosques, you know, they're just like basically Sufi mosques. But to me, those mosques were still primarily inherited by the men. And I didn't feel like I could just jump into those places and, you know, do whatever that, that was there. So, um, uh, Around about, um, you know, September 11th, so we're talking like about 20 years ago or so, when, um, it was actually before then, but you know, when there were different programs among Sufis uh, that began to proliferate in the context of the United States, um, I would go to those programs and I, um, you know, inter encountered different Sufi sheikhs. Uh, but again, I, I, I always seemed to be encountering them from the outside 
and you know then I would just read these fantastic hagiographies and then I would yearn you know but I didn't know exactly what I was even yearning for I just wanted to belong I think um, I met Sheikh Nazim for example who was the Grand Sheikh of the Naqshbandi Sufi order uh, in the mid 1990s um, at a um, interfaith conference at the Vatican and at Riva del Garda in Italy and I I was so fascinated by the energy of his hisba, you know, his 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 charisma is was just so. I think the word is jesba or hisba. Anyway, it was just so strong that um, when he would exit a room, there was an energy shift that would go with him, including obviously his mori would go with him as well, you know. And I just thought, oh, it's just so attractive, you know. And so um, I met him, and uh, we, we sat down and had a one-on-one, -on -one, even though there were lots of people around us. And he drank from a glass of water, and he put the water down, and they said to me, drink, 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 you know. So I drank from that glass of water and drank the whole glass and everything, you know. Didn't know that's supposed to be me taking um, hand with him, but, you know. Um, he uh, invited me to spend Ramadan uh, with him. He was still in the UK at the time. Um, and I just thought, oh, that would be just so perfect to have this opportunity to do this month and everything. But of course, I was single parenting a bunch of kids, and it's like, how am I going to take a month off, you know, plus teaching full time to be able to provide for those kids, you know? So again, it just didn't manifest, you know. Uh, and I make Sheikh, Sheikh Hisham, who uh, was um, one of his regents, one of Sheikh Nazim's regents, because he lived in California for a little while, uh, and he gave me lots of books. You know, um, and he basically did not give me baya. He said because this water drinking thing. Apparently, I, I had you know some type of a hand taken with Sheikh Nazim, and he wouldn't overstep that. You know, uh, so you know it's just like I came close, but it just you know it just it just didn't manifest. I met lots of other you know wonderful sheikhs and uh, sheikhs you know on the path, um, and my sheikh and I were both invited to a program in Washington DC. My Sheikh is, is in Virginia and I was living in Virginia, not within two hours of each other. But um, So that's where we met, uh, but we didn't talk about anything other than what our particular responsibilities were at that particular program. And a friend of mine who at the time was married to a guy who is also Sufi and also um, a professor, um, ended up deciding that that marriage was not going to go for her and in the process she was floating a little bit because her connection to Sufism was more or less to her husband so what she did is she went and she took hand with the, with the person who was my sheikh I'll mention his name in a minute and uh, we were you know, really close and she said, you should take hand with him. And I thought, oh, I don't know. I don't feel that level of trust. And she said, you're never gonna have that level of trust. And it was true. I'm just like, you know, so critical. So I'm not gonna just like jump in, you know, um, even though I jumped into Islam, but you know. So I um, uh, began to be invited to my sheikh's community. I'm going to tell you a little bit about my sheikh's community. My sheikh's community is probably one of the longest running Sufi collective communities in America. They've been together, you know, for at least 40 years. And a bunch of families that started out as a fewer number of families um, pulled their resources together and bought property in the Shenandoah Valley of Virginia. And they started the um, world community and um, they were committed to things like being vegetarian, um, you know, sort of organic foods, uh, growing their own foods, um, educating their children in the Montessori system. Um, in fact, they brought in people to be teachers when they didn't have enough and most of those people ended up joining the community, becoming Muslim and, you know, taking bayah with the sheikh and everything. And then they still run a number of nonprofit organizations that have to do with public health, with leadership, with youth development, and the like. And one of the programs with youth development, they would have a camp, legacy camp. And the camp needed teachers of each gender because they tended to teach the students 
separately in terms of uh, gender um, for the intensive parts and then they would come together collectively for certain other parts. So um, the Sheikh invited me, you know, with my daughters, because again, I couldn't travel without, uh, you know, at the time I was down to just the two daughters, um, invited me to come out and teach Quran during one of these summer camps, or a couple of them actually. And one of the things I noticed every time I visited this community was this deep sense of peace and serenity. And the Sheikh, whose name is Ahmed Abdul Rashid, the Sheikh is a, he's a bit like Santa Claus in that he's sort of, you know, big man with, with a belly and, you know, a beard, although his beard is dark. Um, he always wears a, uh, you know, something on his head. Uh, he also always wears long clothes. He never wears short sleeves, uh, you know, in prayer or anything like that. You know, just a very humble, regal, sincere, twinkle in the eye type person. And um, during this exchange of conversation with my friend, I had been uh, invited there a few times, but I wasn't like thinking about making a commitment because in a way, it was just like a service that was performed in a place where the service was needed that I wanted to and that I did experience, you know, I did experience the light. So I decided, okay, I should, I should do this. I think this is probably the place to do it. And when I approached him about it, he was um, uh, very egoless. And he was like, well, you know, why do you feel that you should do it? Why do you feel that you should do it with me, you know? Etc. Etc. And I basically told the story that when I came there, I did experience this peace. So the process was such that you take hand, and he assigns you certain practices, especially with regard to the um, meditation and uh, reading things like the Hizbul Bahar and stuff like that. Um, and I would drive the two hours with my daughters to visit with the community and they always put me up in a, in a house all on my own and um, you know participate in jumas or you know depending on the days of the week that I was able to go and i um, sorry that my neighbor is rubbing up his motorbike on the outside but I'm 20 minutes in so I'm not gonna stop and start again I don't know how to stop and start again anyway um, so um, uh, in the course of the commitment to him, uh, you know, the thing was that <clears throat> if after two years you feel like this is you know, the path for you, you can then take Baya. Baya is stepping it up another level because as the Sheikh describes it, it is a commitment uh, through all eternity for him that he would be my guide in this life and in the afterlife. And um, I, I rather like that, you know. Uh, and as I said, because this community has a focus on the muraqaba or the meditation, it also brought home for me a practice that I had given up from the days that I was Buddhist and I really gravitate towards that practice. Um, um, so I felt like, you know, it was home. But I have subsequently participated in Sufi circles um, with, for example, the Helminskis, who are Mavlavi Sufis, um, uh, Kabir and Camille. And they usually invite me to be one of the speakers when they have like a retreat. So a lot of respect for me and also challenges me to speak from the heart. My brain's gonna be there, but I don't have to always prepare notes and a paper and all that kind of stuff. Um, and also just to experience what they call the suhba, the company um, of being around people who want to make that level of commitment. And I've met their students in other countries, in Australia, here in Indonesia, in Malaysia, they're, they, you know, they're students. Um, so um, the, being in the company of different Sufi sheikhs, there's others, like mm, my, two of my daughters, uh, took hand with uh, Ibrahim Baba, um, who uh, is a sheikh in the Chisti uh, order. Um, I should say something about the order. Um, when Sufism made the evolution from the sort of quietist, 
piety around the time of Hassan al-Banna and Rabia into the ecstatic Sufis like al-Halaj, um, it was um, sort of determined that you cannot be so outwardly ecstatic because people don't understand and they will kill you, as they did with Halaj. So it became um, outward Sharia, that is, you follow you know, the laws, inward um, uh, Tariqa, that is, you follow the path with the ultimate goal of Hakika, the reality, the grand reality. Um, and so Sufism began to organize itself into different uh, silsilat, different lineages, and each subsequent generation could only teach if they had been given authority or ijaza from someone who had been given authority, etc., etc. So my sheikh, for example, has ijaza in four different uh, tariqas, four different uh, Sufi schools. And um, uh, the ways in which some of the sheikhs over time received their permission was through Uwais, which is a um, transcendental uh, receipt of ijaza. Sometimes they have a dream and they meet a certain sheikh at night. Um, my favorite Sufi uh, is a, a guy who is a part of a Sufi order from um, Afghanistan and he teaches the Afghan students. He met his sheikh in a dream, although he didn't tell his sheikh when he saw him in the person. And he was with his sheikh for two years when he um, told the story to the sheikh how he had seen him in a dream. And it overwhelmed the sheikh so much that he, the sheikh had been driving, he had to pull to the side of the road, he just cried, you know. Uh, so there are different ways in which that happens. Now, at a practical level, since we're coming up to a half an hour, I definitely need to stop. Um, at a practical level, I just want to say that <clears throat> my understanding of Sufism is the spiritual impatient. It is said that everyone, when you follow Islam, uh, you know, do good works and believe in Allah and the Prophet <clears throat> will be rewarded with um, a paradise, and paradise is this complete at one moment with Allah without any barriers. <clears throat> and uh, Sufis are described as the spiritually impatient, those who cannot wait until the afterlife for this at one moment um, with the beloved. Um, so I have always had this kind of spiritual enthusiasm. Um, and so I feel like I was always on my way towards Sufism, and yet I experienced so many blocks in terms of manifesting it in the approved forms. I agree with these approved forms because, not because, um, you know, like some people say, you do certain things and you don't have the proper permission. It's like you're gonna go into some type of scary, you know, scary um, uh, location and, you know, all kinds of the evil things will happen because you're not prepared. I, I don't believe that per se because I think that if you dedicate yourself to Allah and you want to, what they say, polish the mirror of your heart and, you know, you're sincere, um, I basically believe there's no power or strength except in Allah. So I'm not afraid of the devil and I'm not afraid of evil spirits, although I do believe they exist. Um, <clears throat> and they're scary, but you know, I'm just saying, I just think, okay, if this is what Allah has for me, then it's going to come to me. So I, you know, can't be afraid of it. I just have to say, oh, I feel it, you know. Um, so I don't feel that you're under temptation in that way. But I respect the Tariqa uh, system because what happens is there is an alliance with something else towards which there is a silsila or a chain going all the way back through history. And this chain is a kind of spiritual transference. And in my tariqa, that spiritual transference comes um, by uh, a relationship to what they call the lataif, the, the plural of latifa. 
the heart, the root, uh, the spirit, the soul. I mean, it's there's seven of them. I'm not going to elaborate right here. And on, we do a concentration on each of these through different circles. And there are specific words that you say. And I must receive that transmission from my shake. And we do it electronically. And we do it in person. And, you know, the like. I'll just be over the phone if, you know, I mean, if I was in the state of Virginia, which is most of the time I've been for my shake, I've not been in the state of Virginia. Um, and he once told the story about a, um, um, I think it was a net that um, manages to um, catch the scent of its mate from, you know, like 30 miles away and is able to make its way back to the mate. And we know this with migrations of other animals that they somehow know how to get back to the same spot. There's just sort of a, you know, there's sort of like an energetic draw no matter the distance. So I personally believe that and I personally do transmission, um, you know, sessions with my shake uh, at certain intervals, usually um, six, to, uh, six to 12 weeks, every month and a half or three months, depending on, you know, my own sort of spiritual practice. I make determinations like I wanted a new transmission before Ramadan began, even though I'd gotten one, you know, um, within the two months prior because I, you know, I worked on those and I wanted to be able to work on another one when Ramadan came. Um, so the question pragmatically about, you know, this path for other people is number one, do you feel drawn to a certain person, male or female, who has been recognized by a history of lots of other things as a sheikh or sheikha within their you know, particular um, uh, tradition or tariqa, do you feel drawn to that person by their behavior, their akhlaq, their, their dignity, um, the way they teach, the way they interact with other people, the way they interact with you, the way they help you to see the best within yourself and move you forward from where you are. It's important, I think, with uh, Sufism to understand, it's not about you take hen or you take bay'ah, which is a commitment, and then your path is done, but rather you commit to the path through the particulars of the guide or murshid uh, that that uh, you feel you know is is the right one for you, and he or she also uh, feels an alignment with you because you know it doesn't always happen. You know, like I said, I met Sheikh Nazim and it didn't it didn't it didn't happen. I mean, I thought it was amazing and I really wanted to follow, but it wasn't you know it was my path. Um, so you have to first of all learn how to listen to the still small voice inside you. And I also believe that one of the ways to start listening to that voice is to start to practice deep meditation, not in the sense of formally sitting, but rather inspection, introspection, to inspect yourself at the deepest level. And in that course of inspection, to be clear about your levels of sincerity. Um, a lot of people act about Sufism as if it's a club that you can belong to and everybody's gonna do good and you're gonna have your little zigger beads and you're gonna wear your little magic outfits or whatever it goes there, you know. And that's great because Allah is the judge, right? But in my estimation, looking at the history of development of the soul of uh, having experiences with many of the modern day uh, shuyukh, um, I, I think that um, it's, a, it's a lot deeper than that. And um, the number one feature for me is the sincerity of the search. I forgot to mention, I just to say this by the by, because I said I met other Sufis. Uh, when I was a Buddhist, uh, one of the first Sufi saints to be buried in North America, Bawa Mahayuddin, came to Philadelphia as where I was um, as an undergrad and we went to visit while um, I was you know practicing Buddhism 
And I thought he was a lovely man, but again, it didn't happen for me. Um, but um, I ended up with one of his books, which later on, when I became Muslim, I realized the word Allah was written in Arabic in a heart. And I thought, well, what does Guru Bawa have to do with, you know, Allah? And I went back and I found out that they were Sufis. And um, again, that wasn't my that wasn't my calling. So having come up in close proximity to sheikhs and sheikhs over the course of my life, when it came time and it worked out uh, with my sheikh, I pretty much think, well, this is really what's supposed to happen. And I should also say for closing, that because the beginning of this path is this, you, know, you get your first transmission and the sheikh walks you through the steps of you know, what you have to say and that kind of thing. And you, know, you sit down with the group in a little mosque uh, in the Shenandoah Valley and uh, you sit and then he tells you, you know, when it's time to receive that particular transmission. And you know, I did that and you know, I sat uh, for the rest of the you know, uh, hour or 40 minutes you know, with the group. When I left the mosque, I thought, I didn't get it. Whatever it was he was supposed to be giving to me, it didn't come to me. And uh, before I got to the, the dining hall where we were going to share a meal together, I stopped and leaned on one of the cars that was just parked along the roadway that leads down to the mosque. That was beautiful estate. Um, with this just forlorn thing, I said, you've made this commitment and you went in and you got the thing and you didn't get the thing. And I started crying. And I cried for the next half an hour. I mean, the shake was even coming back to go. And I had, you know, walked to the thing. They were trying to help me and everything. And I just couldn't stop crying. And I cried for a good half an hour. It postponed the shakes going into dinner. Everybody was looking at us. You know, she's like, he was like, if you don't want to go in, you don't have to go in. But I have to go in because, you know, I got to take care of the community. Um, I should probably say this to let you know why this was just so powerful. Um, my sister died 10 years ago, and that's literally the last time that I have cried. So the idea that my heart opened up to such an extent was much deeper than my mind could perceive in terms of the experience of the exchange. So I'm not saying that that's going to happen to everybody, but what I'm saying is it is deep within, and the particular teacher that you choose, you want to feel that you could literally give your life over to that person so that when they guide you, no matter how your ego may address it, you'll be able to follow the guidance. Keep in mind that in the meantime, sharing company or suhba with other people who are doing remembrance and, you know, uh, salat and, um, you know, reading Quran and zikr and, you know, that sitting with other people who are doing this is a way to get the heart prepared. But if you really want a teacher, just like they say in terms of going to Hajj, Allah has to invite you. Um, and um, until you get that invitation, no matter what happens, you can't go. So if you really want the teacher, then you want to seek it within the depths of yourself. And then you just have to trust in Allah that it will happen when it's supposed to happen with the person it's supposed to happen with. And then the rest is on how deeply you put yourself into the course of being able to follow that tariqah till the day of gathering. Thank you very much. Salam.